Namibia. Group is three. Namibia. Group is three. When the, the enemy advance, you retreat. When the enemy retire, you attack. This is precisely what we did. Sam Niyome is very deserving of the role of icon of the Namibian liberation struggle. There's no doubt of that. But I could not really believe that his entire tanks and armed cars and, and jet fighters were wiped out. Some say Namibia is the land God made in anger. Endless stretches of savanna, a multiple of undulating hills, arid expanses, and the unforgiving Namib desert all provide spectacular landscapes and an added fortune in natural resources. As the Atlantic Ocean meets the oldest desert in the world, it is a truly spectacular and almost frightening work of nature. In all the greatness and force of this unusual meeting point, the Trans-Kalahari Highway manages to snake through, bringing tourists every day. This fascinating landscape and promising wealth brought German settlers here in the late 1800s. They occupied Namibia, reducing the locals to mere servants and abused workers. Having taken their land, chased them off, and in many cases killed them, natives became tortured and oppressed strangers in their own land. The Hereros and the Nama people of Namibia were the victims of the first genocide of the 20th century in the world. But the locals would stand up and fight to take back their lives and their land and seek freedom. <laughs> Namibia, known as Southwest Africa at the time, was a German colony until the end of the First World War. Between then and 1990, Namibia was occupied and controlled by the then apartheid South Africa. Dr. Sam Shafisuna Nioma was born in the northwestern part of Namibia in 1929. Like all boys in those days, he looked after his parents' cattle and assisted with home chores, including farming. After finishing his primary education in his hometown, he moved to Valvis Bay in 1946 to try and get a job. It was in Valvis Bay that he was exposed to modern world politics by meeting and interacting with soldiers from South America and Europe who had been brought there during the Second World War. At the dawn of 1949, Sam Nioma went to live with his uncle in Windhoek, where he began working for the South African Railways. During this period, he attended adult night school at St. Barnabas in Windhoek's old location. The old location was going to prove to be pivotal in Nioma's fight against apartheid and colonialism. Colonialism was terrible here in Namibia. African children were taught that they have a half a brain to those of the whites. 
and uh, apartheid here is you had it. Uh, every public place like this restaurant, they must have it two doors. Or even if you don't come near the restaurant, you are sold through the windows. During the 1950s, the Vindog municipality and the South African colonial administration decided to forcefully move the residents of the main location eight kilometers to the north of the city, prompting the evicted people to give the new location the name Katutura, meaning the place where we do not want to live. For a number of reasons, most residents did not want to move. They had owned the land in old location, whereas in Katutura, all land belonged to the municipality. The newly allocated lands were also a lot smaller than those in old location, effectively forbidding the creation of gardens. Professor Mburumba Karina is a veteran of the struggle. He remembers those days vividly. The whites, you know, under the apartheid government have always regarded blacks as not being clean. So they must be kept very far away from white people. When the blacks got to their old locations, they started growing pepper trees, eucalyptus trees. And since the place was a hill, a hill, hill it started looking beautiful, and they decided that blacks cannot live in beautiful places like that. Only whites have to live there. They decided to move blacks to this Katutura. Economically, black residents were worse off after the move because they now had to pay rent to the municipality and they needed a bus to reach their workplaces in town. Old location had been in walking distance. Dr. Nyoma's passion for politics and a yearning to see his people free from the restrictive pass law system compelled him to resign from the South African Railways in 1957 at the age of just 29. He also had a yearning to see his people free from the restrictive pass laws system that prevented blacks from moving freely around the country. The pass laws required black Africans to carry identity documents in the form of a reference book when outside set areas. The pass laws are considered one of the most grievous methods that the South African government used to enforce apartheid. That's the exact picture. Yeah, that's exactly the picture. Yeah. Yeah. Very importantly too, Sam Nyoma had found inspiration in the words and actions of the early Namibian resistance leader Hendrik Witboy who fought many battles against German occupation in the 1800s. Hendrik Wittboy and the other traditional leaders such as uh, Chief Maharero, the, the Herero people, those who were, to us, they were revolutionary. We were inspired by them. Hendrik Wittboy, for example, died in the combat at uh, Farahras in 1905. So this is, is written. Now, when we, we, we see him, a picture of him with a, with a rifle, we say we must get this rifle source. <laughs> but how to get it? Together with his comrades, he also organized resistance against the forceful removal of the inhabitants of the old location to the new township of Katutura, which was based on the apartheid policy of racial segregation. This resistance resulted in the massacre of 12 innocent, unarmed people on the 10th of December, 1959. The Boers would not tolerate <laughs> just equality to them is an insult. So we thought that we must do something, especially after the uprisings on the 10th of December, 1959, uh, in Wintuk, where 12 people were killed by the Boers. Uh, we were being arrested, including myself. Utoni Nioma is Sam Nioma's first son. He was born in 1952 during the struggle against apartheid. Utoni was eight years old when his father went into exile. I grew up 
in the normal colonial apartheid setting where we were living in, in the, what you call the high density areas where they were calling them locations. And uh, what I can remember during that time is was, it was when the South African authorities, the apartheid police, uh, raided our home. I was very small at that time. I could see white men all over, police, officials, looking for documents, searching our house. Sam Nyoma had gone into exile in 1960 after being arrested and charged with breaking the pass law system, organizing resistance activities and political rallies. In fact, when I, I escaped from the country, I jumped with bail because I was supposed to be tried and uh, I paid bail. So uh, while on the way, I, I escaped through then the British Botswana land, Southern Odessa now, Zimbabwe, Northern Odessa, now Zambia. Exile for him was all about lobbying outside help from free African countries like Ghana, Egypt, Libya, Sudan, Liberia, and other parts of the world. Nioma had been pleading with the UN to facilitate Namibia's independence. There was two alternatives. If we fail di through diplomatic uh, activity and a political campaign at the international level, we don't get the armed struggle. And this is what we did. Oh, of course, the armed struggle it took longer. Dr. Nioma transported the first weapons that were used at the launch of the armed struggle against South Africa on August 26, 1966. The arms came through a very drawn-out route from Algeria through Egypt, Sudan, Tanzania and Zambia and finally into Namibia. If you go in exile and they obtain the firearms to fight against the, the Boers and this is precisely what we did. We get the Katusha from the Soviet Union and now the Russian Federation. And the Boers did not thought that we could get such a powerful firearms. Because they were fighting conventional warfare. We adopted guerrilla warfare tactics. Uh, like Mao Zedong said that uh, uh, when the, uh, the enemy advance, you retreat. When the enemy retire, you attack. This is precisely what we did with the whites here. Because whites in South Africa and Namibia put together, they were more than the indigenous people in Namibia. So guerrilla warfare is the only war that could bring them down. Over 11,000 struggle soldiers and hundreds more unarmed civilians were killed during the battles that followed. Apartheid troops attacked refugee camps with poisonous gases, killing unarmed women and children. There are times where the enemy jet fighters could attack some of our refugee camps like the, 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 the Kwanzaa and the Nyango in the, both in Zambia, they attempted to attack our refugee camps. Kasinga is a small town along the Zambian border. Here there was a Namibian refugee and military camp. Under Piet Bota, the South African president at the time, apartheid forces attacked this camp early one morning when everyone was still sleeping. Over 700 people were killed and hundreds more injured. Like his father, Utoni dedicated his life to the struggle. He spent many years in exile and was a specialist frontline guerrilla fighter. His determination to join his father in exile and fight the nation's case encouraged hundreds of other young Namibians at the time to follow him. My father has always been a comrade, as I told you, that uh, we were together in the struggle, and I, I really appreciate the fact that he sent me for military training. Together with my comrades, uh, 
him as commander-in-chief commanding us, visiting us from time to time at the front line, was always an encouragement. Comrades, commanders, officers no, and men no. of the People's Liberation Army of Namibia, I would first of all wish to pay tribute and to congratulate you for the gallant and brave military operations you have been carrying out and above all the liquidation of the enemy forces which you have carried out during the past year. Veteran journalist and founder of the yeah, Namibian okay. newspaper, okay, so Gwen Lister, lived through the struggle, reporting about it in her writings, and got to know Sam Nyoma intimately. Well, Sam Nyoma is undoubtedly um, the icon, or the main icon, of the Namibian struggle for freedom of independ uh, and independence. Um, I first got to meet him in 1981. He was incredibly committed to Namibian independence and freedom. And I do recall meeting him very often in those days. All he really wanted to talk about was Namibia and um, the fact that one day it would be free. As the struggle continued, international support for Namibia's independence increased. Of course, at the end, the MPLA government in Angola and the Cuban International Forces with the Namibia Plan People's Liberation, I mean Namibia's Swapos military wing. It quit to Naval battle, we attacked them. But I could not really believe that his entire tanks and armed cars and jet fighters were wiped out. The UN was compelled to implement Resolution 435, stipulating the withdrawal of the apartheid government of South Africa from Namibia. In Namibia's first democratic elections, SWAPO, the organization spearheading the fight against apartheid, gained a majority. Mr. Sami Yoma, President-elect of the Republic of Namibia, being saluted and greeted. Sam Nyoma was elected to be the first president of the Republic of Namibia. On 21st March 1990, he was sworn in as the President and Commander-in-Chief of the Namibian Defence Force. Joyous greeting from the crowd. Mr. President-elect, I congratulate you on your election. The people of South Africa join me in wishing you and the people of the new nation of Namibia prosperity and good fortune. May Almighty God be with you and bless you. I thank you. For Nyoma, it was the start of more than a decade as leader of the nation, being elected twice more into office in 1994 and 1999. However, his government had its fair share of problems, and as with many founding fathers, he did not respond to criticism very well, especially from the press. In the same way as we had cast a, a very an eye of scrutiny on what the apartheid regime was doing, so too 
we felt that we should be the watchdog over the new government. Um, and I think this was where misunderstandings came uh, between ourselves and the SWAPO leadership. The president eventually decided that the Namibian was being anti-government in its reporting and he put a ban on government advertising in the Namibian and government purchasing copies of the Namibian in 2000. This country has a number of revered places, but the Heroes Acre is on a whole new level. As part of Sam Nioma's legacy, it is a modern state-of-the-art symbol and a very sacred place. Sam Nioma initiated its construction as a motivation to foster a spirit of patriotism and nationalism. It holds and preserves the memory of fallen Namibians who made meaningful contributions to the freedoms enjoyed today. When we think about Dr. Nuyoma, we think about a paradigm shift uh, in the sense that he took from the resistance struggle the spirit of freeing this nation collectively with other national leaders and walk plus minus three decades for the liberation of this country. Dr. Akawa, a historian at the University of Namibia, she believes that Dr. Sam Nioma laid a good foundation for the unity and peace that Namibia has maintained since independence. As the first president of this country for the first 10 years, he still did, for me, I think he deserved to be the first president because of the role he played, especially in nation building. I mean, you can imagine how scattered the nation was, how unsure they were. But then he, he, he really made it a point that we come together and start on a clean slate to build a nation. Katutura, the place where sparks of the struggle for independence began, is now home to the man and the struggle veteran who worked closely with Sam Nioma and actually gave Namibia its name. And I went through, as I was growing up among our Nama people, to find out about the names of our deserts. I thought about the Kalahari Desert and it didn't quite ring the bell. And then I thought about the Nama name for the Namib Desert the home of uranium. And I said, that's it. I decided to name our country, when it is free, the Republic of Namib. In 2005, Nyoma stunned everyone by stepping down from power, a very rare action, especially considering that for some reason, a lot of contemporary African leaders would rather hang on to power forever. Ten years on from retirement, Nyoma is still a very busy person. Now though, he occupies himself by mostly spending time at his citrus farm and cattle ranch in the north of the country where his foundation is also constructing schools and health facilities for the local communities. You see, this is uh, from grade 1 to grade 10, but it's going to be extended up to grade 12. For all the children who are, whose parents are uh, farm workers, up to now, after independence, they don't attend the school. The whites, they send their children to to boarding schools you know, in towns like Windhoek and, uh, and other towns. The rest of the African children remain. So that uh, I will start now here that every child must attend the school in the country. Because education is the key to knowledge, this is the key to power. I bought this farm. After independence, of course, because before independence, no black allowed to be allowed to buy land. 
and apartheid regime. Best, also good milk. They give a lot of milk. On the land is where Nioma feels more at home. He spent his early childhood on a farm. Photo. We will drive it just. No, no. I would like to see agriculture, so that we produce enough food for our population and export food from here. Oh, I think they open up here. Oh, eh? oh, we go there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, naturally, in Namibia, from the northern region where I was brought up, the, the people are farmers. Farming with the cattle, producing uh, millet. You can see here Fidel Castro, uh, Nelson Mandela, President de Pohamba, President de Jose Eduardo Santos, uh, myself. Uh, this is the Kupani, this is President de Agustin Neto of Angola. Here in 1976. President of Angola and myself. And this President of Pohamba with myself in 1967. It was in Cairo in Egypt. Back at his home, Sam Nioma acknowledges and is always quick to show appreciation to fellow African leaders who helped him in advocating the independence of Namibia. Yeah, this is with my family. With my, this is... This is my, my, my mother, my sister, and then my sister who's behind me. And this is my brother. This is my, my father and my mother. And this is my wife, and now with the children, the elder one, Utoni. Utoni is here. And this, uh, this year he passed away, and this one is a big girl. The girl also passed away. Here I was addressing the speech. In Wolves Bay. Here I was, at, I was addressing a rally. And, uh, this is the, just the picture. Here we are dancing with the, with the girls uh, in the bush. And uh, this is Dr. Indongo. He was the, 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 the medical doctor we. We trained, and he was my personal doctor during the war. From his childhood to him fighting for freedom, one thing is evident. Sam Nayoma has always loved Namibia, the land, the people, and most importantly, the freedom.